very pleasant good evening to the uh, guest speaker dr j mohammed ahmed scientist from nrsc staff members of uh, department of agronomy dear scholars very pleasant good evening to all today we are going to have the lecture on application of remote sensing in agriculture so it's a important topic we are using for different uh, purposes especially the remote sensing and wide application in all the sectors of our life it's more so in uh, agriculture also so in this occasion i welcome all the uh, people in, from uh, tamil nadu agriculture university coimbatore and also from scientists from up campus they are also attending here through online so our uh, scientist the guest speaker dr j mohammed ahmed uh, is uh, presently working in regional remote sensing center nrsc department of space in bangalore he is the fittest person to deliver the application technologies to agriculture i met him uh, earlier he came to uh, visited coimbatore uh, this is the fourth time i hope so he was the uh, external uh, examiner for the phd scholar of our department also so he is having vast experience in, in developing assessment of doubt man the national level uh, it consists of five scientist uh, committee is one among the five so such a wonderful man we are having then crop acreage assessment that's that we were but we are uh, assessing the crop different seasons different seasons uh, especially curry and rabi what is the acreage is it not what is the use of uh, assessing the acreage by assessing the acreage only we can able to predict what is the level of production in curry crop what is the acre coverage in taken up sowing this uh, directly indicate the output okay so i think you might have seen in hindu paper during the karif season every weekly there is the advancement in sowing of karif crop in millets rabi pulses like that they give so those who are very closely monitoring only because of these kind of people working in the acreage coverage and then the next important thing is production estimation how they are importing the wheat or exporting the other crop to other uh, the crop which are production produced in uh, high quantity can be exported to the other uh, countries these are being done based on the estimation of crop production that is more important the estimation also be done in several phases one at the time of flowering and another at the time of uh, near before harvesting so the accuracy is near flowering our university our vice chancellor madam also be involved in yield estimation in different crops our vice chancellor madam she she used to give the forecast twice one at the time of before flowering before harvest 15 days before harvest so the accuracy is almost 85 to 90% before harvest the second phase uh, good accuracy so in this um, in this way uh, our speaker is well versed in crop acreage estimation production estimation in maize bajra and groundnut then hyperspectral remote sensing is also done good lot of work and also the carbon fluxes medi covariants so these are the thing he is uh, uh, well experienced i request all the staff members and students kindly listen to his presentation because when he come for presentation he may have referred several journals and books and research that so in a gist form he is going to present so take this at the time efficiently and try to uh, get clarify all your queries don't reserve any uh, queries within your mind don't think that it is a simple question whether we can ask or even though it is simple uh, kindly uh, exchange whatever you are having in your mind you exchange or discuss with him freely so that you can get empower your knowledge it's only a capacity building so with this uh, few words i welcome the guest speaker to deliver his lecture uh, friends uh, this is a very broad topic uh, remote sensing applications in agriculture 
So with uh, one hour, I'll try to make it more interactive. And uh, here, uh, instead of going in a sequential manner, I'll just show you some of the uh, examples as to how where uh, uh, this uh, remote sensing can be used as a tool. Uh, then with your specializations uh, in various disciplines. At the same time, I'll also uh, tell you a few of the uh, thrust areas where you also can concentrate or work on it, which is the need we are these days. So with this background, so I'll start. And before I start with this three, uh, uh, three or four uh, images that I have put in the first slide, you can make out that they are in different colors. So here in the lower side, uh, you must be uh, aware of some of the basics of remote sensing. So the images are in false color composite. However, on the right hand side, the uh, lengthier image which is there, it is in natural color composite. And you can also see certain features you can see uh, in the downside images here, uh, wherein uh, is more like a plantation. Uh, one is seen more clearly, one uh, which is less denser. And uh, so even if it is the same plantation also, because of changes in resolution, they are viewed differently and they uh, you know, are meant for different purposes also. So if I want to do a study on a larger scale, so I may not have a very high resolution data that is covering the entire uh, region at one time. So then I may have to go for some other uh, resolution and work with. Likewise, if I want to uh, do a farm level study, I need a very high resolution data uh, for its own uh, specific purposes. So just that was one of the basic things I just wanted to convey with these uh, photographs. And the left hand side uh, rectangular image that you are seeing is a hyperspectral image of uh, four meter resolution for uh, uh, one, some part of OT. Here in this slide, I have uh, tried to list out some of the possible applications in agriculture. There may be many more than this. Uh, like uh, one of the immediate application is identifying crops. So a, a, a crop area estimation. And then once I know the area, I also need to know the production. So how do I do that? So that also we can discuss in the short time. Further, uh, for crop phases, uh, moisture stress, which leads to large crop losses and uh, that we uh, in agriculture call it as agriculture drought. Likewise, there are, there are many kinds of droughts. Here I'll just address agriculture drought, how assessment and monitoring can be done. Further, uh, one of the uh, biggest contributor nowadays uh, to our Indian agriculture is horticulture produce. So how to map those horticulture crops? And uh, uh, what are all the possible ways wherein you can uh, try to uh, estimate the yield in horticulture crops. So then cropping system analysis. Uh, then next comes using these thing, uh, crop information via remote sensing and taking the uh, uh, climate forecast data and analyzing the, whether that particular crop or cropping system would be uh, sustainable in the uh, changing climate scenarios. So such kind of studies uh, can be carried out uh, on a spatial scale. Further, it is a tremendous. Uh, it gives us a. So we also have a, a tremendous advantage here uh, of utilizing the remote sensing data products. For water resources monitoring, then how effectively we can use uh, the rain. Uh, I mean uh, the irrigation water. So some of the examples I'll uh, try to highlight it. Then likewise, uh, when there is no crop, how the base soil data information from remote sensing satellite data products uh, can a help you in soil mapping. So what are all the techniques that are coming up and uh, some case studies, if uh, possible, I'll uh, try to tell you within this one hour. And further, nowadays, uh, many new applications are coming up. So one of the applications are use of uh, deep learning and artificial intelligence in pest and disease forecasting or pest and disease identification at the farm level. So what are all the possibilities wherein you all can uh, from uh, pathology or uh, entomology division. You know? So wherein you can try and develop such forecasting models 
uh, and uh, try to implement it on mobile and uh, share it uh, via server through farmers and further uh, uh, that can be operationalized. And uh, similarly, remote sensing as a tool is effectively being utilized in identifying potential fishing zones. Uh, so all such things. So I'll try to address some of them in the uh, coming slides. Next slide, please. Yeah. So this is one example uh, where I just wanted to show you. See, Kharif season, we have uh, cloud cover. So and uh, you will be aware that during cloud cover period, we will uh, have limitation of using optical data sets because optical data sets when cloud is there, you may not be able to uh, know what, uh, uh, what what crop is there and uh, uh, you will have a lot of difficulties when you have uh, repetitivity, less repetitivity of optical data sets because most of the times we try to as a students, you know, we we need some free data sets with which we can use and develop our methodologies. And uh, if we go for uh, data sets like Planet M, they're expensive and uh, even though they are available uh, uh, on every uh, alternate days uh, interval. But uh, for us in regional studies and also for students uh, to use the data sets, we generally prefer uh, data sets that is uh, relatively free and uh, softwares that are open source in nature and uh, at the same time easily uh, doable understandable and doable. So in that way, when we see we have limitations in optical data sets uh, because of cloud cover in Kharif season. So then the next best alternative is what? So then the next best alternative is microwave data sets. What microwave data set does? So the, those bands, you know, they can penetrate through clouds and you get the information. Uh, so microwave data set works with the basic principle of and identifying the differences in terms of backscatter and dielectric properties of a material. So surface roughness, surface roughness and the dielectric properties of a material determines the backscatter that comes from a surface, uh, from surface which can be sensed through microwave data sets. And nowadays we are getting very good uh, uh, data products of very high resolution uh, like Sentinel and our own uh, Indian uh, data products, US4, kind of data sets, you know, so are there which can be utilized uh, in identifying crops. And here what happens is once you do uh, delay operation and uh, once uh, the land surface appears smooth, backscatter is say suppose here you can see the darker regions Darker regions, what has happened? They have completed the tillage operations and then puddled this uh, surface and uh, water uh, is standing. So the uh, the backscatter, since the sur surface is smooth, the backscatter values are greater than 17 dB, something that is shown here in the field, like in, in 19th August second date from there. I'm sorry, you do not have pointer. Then uh, likewise, as and when tra uh, transplanting happens, uh, then uh, what happens? Uh, see this smooth surface. Uh, once the uh, uh, microwave uh, wave uh, falls on the smooth surface, and then it gets scattered with the presence of uh, the plant that is transplanted. After, say, suppose after ten days of transplanting, you have a standing crop, and then the the wave once uh, it falls on the uh, soil and then gets uh, uh, reflected via or scattered via the standing crop, then you get a double bounce and that is sensed uh, by the receiver antenna. And uh, likewise, we get the backscatter differences as and when uh, the crop grows and the temporal changes in the backscatter characteristics of the crop are measured and through which we estimate, uh, we identify a particular crop. And you know, for each of the crop, it will have different backscatter characteristics and certain times we also should know remote sensing is not the answer for everything we should the remote sensing we can use it as a tool with our subject background say for example i am an agronomist so i want to know uh, the crop so i i should know its phenology and then what happens uh, then if i have a crop like for example maize is there and in the next field if i have bajra or if i have uh, jowar sown then they are phenologically similar so at that time you it is difficult to identify similar phenologically looking crops uh, which are uh, i mean grown side by side 
At the same time, when I have a temporal data set uh, of uh, same microwave data sets spread across uh, the season, I may get a few uh, uh, satellite data passes wherein the backscattered differences between these two crops are are different are differentiable. At the same time, during uh, flowering or during uh, panicle initiation, something like that. At that time, the back, there will be unique backscatter of uh, these two crops. So such kind of characteristics, first we have to first we have to characterize these crops, identify their uh, backscatter characteristics or reflectance properties, then go in for uh, uh, identifying the crops using uh, any of the machine learning algorithms uh, which uh, are available. So that is uh, the basic uh, principle for all the crops that we do. And uh, now why I'm uh, showing you the here is, uh, see in green uh, curve you can see uh, since uh, after uh, the uh, water is standing in the field, you can see the backscatter is very less. It is going up to 19 dB, something like that. And then once transplanting happens, that backscatter starts increasing. So, uh, and it stays maximum somewhere around between uh, 80 to 90 days after transplanting. So when I have only one or two dates, probably it may, uh, that backscatter might intermix with some other crop. But when I have this entire profile, uh, so some five or six date data sets, and then that backscatter, uh, if I compare with other crops, so these crops will become separable from each other. So in this way, I, I, I differentiate for example, here a rice crop from other crops. So now the question comes. So already rice crop is identifiable. Now what we can do? Uh, so there are many crops wherein uh, methodologies have not been developed. So there is a lot of scope for students, scientists, uh, professors uh, in contributing here. Like we have so many, uh, like even with, within the crop, uh, short duration, long duration varieties. Uh, then uh, amongst crops, uh, we have uh, dominant crops are uh, some operational methodologies have come up, but for uh, scattered Kharif crops, still uh, operational methodologies have not come up. So there is a scope wherein students and all others can contribute in developing these methodologies. And uh, for uh, one more advantage here is now uh, uh, through Google Earth Engine, you, if you have a very good uh, PC with good internet, and uh, so that much is enough uh, via Google Earth Engine, you can uh, call these uh, data sets and uh, in Google Earth Engine Cloud Platform, you can uh, do all these uh, necessary calculations. So one additional thing what would be required, you will have to have ground truth information for which for a selected location, you may have to go and collect the GPS points, bring them and we'll incorporate into the uh, software so by by doing so so without having uh, additional uh, software requirement you just with small uh, understanding of uh, google earth engine which you can learn it in a uh, uh, small duration of time and all online free codes and uh, uh, coursework materials are available which i'll show in the last slide from where you can fetch them uh, you can start learning and uh, uh, developing these methodologies so similarly sir uh, like for example, uh, at national scale, when we talk for operational area estimation, so if we have around some 10 crops, but we know that there are more than 25 crops. So there, like right now, we can have 15 crops which are left out to be operationalized, wherein the universities across India, then for their regions, their methodologies can be developed and operationalized. So that is one component. And uh, this is with regard to uh, microwave data. Similarly, during the rabi season, uh, we do not have much uh, disturbance by uh, a cloud. So optical data is there. So optical data, you can see uh, here in the slides, I have put some six uh, optical data, data sets starting from November to February, uh, where uh, for some part of uh, Punjab I have shown, wherein you can see in the November, uh, so due to bare soil uh, presence, uh, it is more cyan in color, soil background is seen. And as and when sowing starts, uh, you can see from the uh, southern portion of each of those uh, uh, images, uh, this reddish uh, redness increases. That means uh, the uh, crop starts growing and it, it's getting manifested uh, on the uh, image. And uh, in term, when I have a false color composite displayed, so 
vegetation is looking red. So the intensity of redness increases and during the peak vegetative phase uh, like uh, uh, January to February, you can see the maximum redness in the image that is displayed here. So then here, what are all the challenges? So you have, say, for example, a, a state like Punjab, uh, I have mustard, you know, mustard is grown, then uh, we have uh, wheat is grown. So likewise, parallelly there, uh, sugarcane also is grown and uh, such crops and uh, identifying between these crops. So for which single day data, sometimes during peak vegetative phase, I can uh, estimate using machine learning algorithms with fair degree of accuracy. However, if I have the liberty of having more, num more number of data sets, the accuracy still increases. So that is an advantage of having temporal data sets. Another thing is, say this uh, uh, method of area identification is well known. Then what next? So next com part comes is production estimation. How do I estimate the production of these crops? So in the coming slides, I'll just show you some of the hints. Uh, so how best we can estimate the production and there are several techniques. So a few of the techniques I'll uh, uh, highlight it. So this is one of the example uh, where I have shown you that uh, we have, uh, this is one district called Kalburgi. Uh, they here, basically it is dominant uh, with uh, tour crop, red gram. Uh, then, uh, we have gone to field. So do, these dots, you know, that are highlighted onto this uh, uh, image are the ground truth points collected by some of our uh, uh, colleagues. And in the right hand side, you can see the crop stages as well as different crops photographs and uh, also its profile. And uh, you can see when there is a peak, the sigmoidal curve here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, here. Fine, 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 sir. See here uh, in the, at this peak stage, we can see a lot of difference in the spectral reflectance that is there. Uh, and uh, maybe at this particular stage, along with uh, this, uh, this date of acquisition would help me in identifying uh, the different crops. Basically, the next is this once I have uh, used the GT on these temporal data sets, I have classified the image and uh, the output is shown here. And uh, since uh, what practically working, what I would like to share with you is if it is a dominant crop, accuracy estimations are uh, relatively better. But when we have uh, competing crops and if it is not dominant in nature, so the methodologies there needs to be developed as to how best I can use various other uh, machine learning or different kind of algorithms or combination of algorithms with which I can improve the uh, area estimates. So area estimates should uh, uh, always be more than 80% and above and uh, consistent, especially consistent in nature. So these are some of the areas in area estimation where uh, uh, students and others can uh, contribute. Likewise, when I have for the entire year the temporal data sets, so I can uh, know in Kharif what particular crop is grown, Rabi which particular crop is grown, some of uh, whether it is fallow or uh, still any other in, in irrigated region, some crops are grown or not. And uh, by overlaying uh, them all, I can come out with the uh, cropping pattern, then what kind of crop rotation that is being followed. So all such informations uh, can be uh, estimated, especially on a larger regional scale. So here, the requirement is we should have ground truth information statistically significant enough uh, to have a, a accurate uh, estimates, and uh, that would not be to such an extent uh, as much that is required. What is being followed by the state departments? Uh, so, like for example, if I have say around. Uh, depending on the uh, diversity of the region. Uh, just a, as an example, I'm telling some 50 ground truths of one particular crop, but such particular ground truth I should have for all other competing crops as well, so that I get uh, proper uh, uh, accurate, uh, specially uh, identifiable area for each crop. So in similar 
way, uh, these are examples here that are shown uh, for uh, uh, even Uttar Pradesh, wherein different uh, um, crops, you know, are uh, being and uh, what kind of crops that are grown, what is the cropping intensity there, uh, then cropping pattern there. So that have been mapped. So this kind of uh, thing can be done. Uh, provided we have a sufficient amount of uh, cloud free data sets, cloud free optical data sets. And uh, next, if I uh, move from acreage estimation to production estimation, uh, there are uh, various methods. I'm just here uh, in the first slide showing you uh, fossil uh, related uh, slide, which is uh, forecasting agricultural output through uh, uh, space agrometeorology and land based observations. So here, uh, in the pre sowing uh, state of uh, forecast, uh, generally we use uh, the econometric models, whereas agrometeorological information and field information are used in the early season assessment and mid season assessment. We use all three more remote sensing field observations and meteorological observations. Likewise, pre harvest and uh, revised forecasts. So for this. How it is approached? So you can see here. Uh, we have multi date uh, uh, satellite data sets. So wherein we will uh, overlay the ground truth information. Then. By uh, and then classify the uh, image, we get some uh, acreage and to that acreage information. Uh, for uh, uh, crop yield estimation, I either I can go for agromet method then uh, or I can go for spectro agromet methods. Spectro agromet means I also include the uh, spectral reflectance, uh, either directly uh, reflectance bands or the vegetation indices calculated by that uh, uh, alongside the uh, agromet uh, uh, parameters and uh, related to the uh, crop cutting experiments yield and uh, come out with uh, uh, yield estimate and uh, Similarly, there are several other approaches. So for example, I can use a simulation model and relate that uh, simulation model uh, calibrated simulation models output to that of uh, the uh, spectral reflectance or the backscatter and uh, relate that to yield and convert that into a spatial yield. And there are few other methods as well. So you as you will uh, as you are uh, very good with uh, uh, agrometeorology. So we also can make use of the light use efficiency models. So some of them call it as uh, uh, semi physical models or some of them call as a radiation use efficiency models or something like that. So wherein uh, we can use the par information, then convert it into FA par and uh, uh, temporal uh, uh, constraints from uh, say, for example, you know, at on field. Uh, crop suffers from uh, moisture stress and how that we can incorporate that information can be incorporated by using some of the vegetation indices that are sensitive to uh, water uh, water stress like NDWI or LSWI something like that and uh, see NDVI also is a manifestation of the entire uh, management practices for each of that pixel curve if we talk about a pixel uh, so that particular NDVI will be the representative of a all the factors interactions that are happening in the field, for example, with different uh, uh, management practices that are done with different uh, uh, sowing dates or something like that. And that is again a constraint. It, it, it may be a potential if it is or if all things are followed properly, it can uh, act as one of the pixels for potential yield or uh, if uh, uh, if it is under stress, it can also act as a constraining factor. So such informations if I incorporate along with FA power and the harvest index uh, and the radiation use efficiency of each particular crop, then uh, I can finally come out with yield uh, NPP based uh, yield uh, for uh, each crop. So that is relatively easier to do and uh, it gives a uh, uh, better results as compared to that of uh, simulation models because simulation models initially might require a lot of data sets unless we have the information ready in a spatial form for like for example soil we have we should know different layers of uh, soil information that are there the fertility information uh, and so many other factors uh, likewise the genetic coefficients that are required and the weather parameters minimum four uh, that are required into the models and then uh, run that model but uh, these are relatively directly you can uh, uh, arrive at uh, the yield. 
So there should be a trade off uh, initially to come out with yield estimates unless still sound and better models keep getting developed and for which necessary databases are developed. So two things here. One, developing methodologies wherein we can estimate yield, uh, which can directly get into the system for uh, uh, policy makers as well as insurance related products. And parallelly, we also should uh, keep developing better methodologies which can oh, uh, circumvent the limitations that are that are present in the existing methodologies for which uh, both uh, uh, I mean uh, the entire university departments can contribute a lot. So to uh, make uh, uh, this process uh, easier, so we have uh, also developed some of the mobile app information so that uh, taking two points into consideration. One is the information that is collected onto the ground that stays uh, onto the server for a longer duration and at the same time uh, access. Uh, it also has a geofencing kind of a concept. I cannot sit here, open the mobile app and click some point in some location and uh, uh, collect the information. But uh, that app, you know, unless otherwise I go to that particular survey number, stand there, take the photograph, it won't record the observations. So such kind of features have been incorporated and mobile apps have been developed wherein a particular person who has to go and collect information, information, he goes there, collect all the necessary informations like what is the crop, stage of the crop, uh, then if is collecting yield, uh, those yield parameters uh, incorporates into the app and from there directly they, uh, along with the uh, geotag photo, it goes and sits into the server, which can be accessed by uh, the related personnel for further analysis and also the policy makers or the higher ups for uh, visualizing that. So in that way, for entire India, all the uh, ground truth and data products are collected that through Malanobis National Crop Forecast Center sits in, in our server and uh, their uh, proper uh, data record is being maintained. And further, you know, for students can uh, write to the director MNCFC uh, in Ministry of Agriculture for uh, certain districts of their interest for previous years, ask them to provide those ground truth information where they will provide that information using because students, for all students, it may not be possible to go on real time basis to collect the information and come. They can collect take this information, incorporate onto the uh, freely available data sets onto Google Earth Engine or some of the open source softwares that are there and uh, carry out their uh, necessary research uh, works. So this is one of the example where uh, we in TNAU, uh, as we in ISRO as well as uh, uh, the TNAU scientists here, uh, RSNGIS team, uh, we worked together in uh, developing a spatial uh, yield model for maize in uh, Perambalur district. So basically what we have done is, uh, we, we, uh, we all know that we have a D, uh, DSAT uh, uh, software uh, simulation model. So that was calibrated here. And uh, we, uh, from our side, what we did was we uh, specialized this model. So we made this, since this model runs on a point scale, we made it to run continuously for each of the grid uh, pixel size of uh, somewhere around uh, right now for 500 meter resolution. Uh, so for every 500 meter resolution as a centroid, it takes up the weather data information, it takes up the soil data information, soil data sets we have at one is to 50,000 scale for this region and uh, weather data sets uh, more than uh, uh, almost around uh, uh, 10 uh, uh, weather stations which are specially gridded and that uh, gridded information it extracts automatically which here again this plugin is on an open source software called QGIS. So one can open this and uh, then uh, incorporate these parameters and uh, dominant uh, genetic coefficient grown in this uh, a variety you know, uh, grown in this region. So its genetic coefficient was taken and incorporated into the model and uh, uh, we are now able to execute this model spatially and now we have uh, plans to execute this on a national scale by taking incorporating the dominant varietal information and uh, testing the uh, coming year. So this is one of the applications. So likewise, this is just one crop. Uh, likewise, for there are so many other crops wherein uh, we can uh, develop such similar modules and uh, which are both helpful for uh, policy makers as well as uh, the uh, uh, farmers. So how it is helpful for both that also I'll explain in the coming slides. So this is just for you to see 
uh, how uh, the satellite data sets, uh, you know, when they are converted to some index, uh, like an, a normalized difference vegetation index here, uh, which shows you the greenness, uh, uh, which indirectly tells you about the uh, health uh, uh, and growth of uh, uh, crop. Uh, you can see from June to November, these data sets are uh, kept at every fortnightly intervals. And with every image, once you move from uh, June here, you can keep uh, you can see that the greenness is increasing. So this is how you know the temporal data sets helps us in uh, taking advantage of uh, uh, the uh, I mean remote sensing. How best we can use them. And uh, since uh, you can you also can see that this is entire state. So we can have a synoptic uh, view um, of the entire region. Uh, then at a consistent scale and uh, specified time. And this also will be a data record um, for a long term database, wherein apart from the uh, current and uh, uh, user needs, we also can use it for uh, climate uh, ch change related studies. So such kind of uh, information can be derived and uh, uh, we can work on this. And this is another example just uh, with uh, one or two slides I'll show you here uh, as to. Uh, basically, I worked here uh, and my starting uh, from my star, star, starting days of my career, National Agriculture Drought Assessment and uh, Monitoring System. So basically what we do here is we incorporate the uh, information extracted from uh, the temporal uh, satellite data sets, uh, then uh, uh, added uh, from uh, alongside the meteorological information line, uh, like rainfall and its derivatives, then uh, agronomic information. So these things are integrated here and uh, we uh, do this analysis at every uh, fortnightly intervals and report is generated on monthly intervals uh, for entire uh, earlier for uh, 14 agricultural dominant states. Now for entire India at the 56 meter resolution, uh, wherein we uh, initial stages we identify the uh, districts which have uh, de deficit uh, rainfall and such things in the subsequent slide I'll show you. And then in the later part of the crop growing stages, we declare that whether that uh, the severity of uh, the particular uh, stress like drought, you know, whether it is moderately severe, uh, then very severe, all those things. And this once uh, analyzed, you know, it is uh, reports are disseminated to respective states uh, and the ministries. So now, uh, Ministry of Agriculture has made it mandatory to incorporate uh, uh, remote sensing database products uh, in for the drought declaration. So th they have uh, further modified the manual and they say that now we can uh, uh, in at the initial stages rainfall based triggers are there and the uh, second uh, stage which is trigger two uh, where, wherein we both use remote sensing based uh, indices then crop situation, soil moisture and hydrological uh, conditions. So these things are considered for drought declaration. So how they are considered in the slides I have shown you here. Due to positive of time, I'll just uh, uh, tell you a little faster. You can go through the slides in the later stages. So this is just uh, you know, to share, tell you how drought assessment is done here. Then further, uh, due to uh, you know unseasonal rains or hailstorms or due to floods, a crop gets damaged. So here for a larger area with very quick assessment, this is one I think only tool that is uh, available with which we can uh, do quick assessment of a uh, damage assessment. Uh, say for example, uh, uh, these summer times we have a lot of hailstorm that come and many standing crops get damaged. So very fast we can do the uh, damage assessment. So now there are various means again if we do not have satellite data. So we have aircraft borne uh, sens uh, sensors uh, wherein we can fly to those regions, uh, then uh, take the uh, data, acquire the data products, process it, and uh, within a very short span of time, analyze the results. And likewise, if it is a smaller region uh, and if we, it's a very economically important crop and we need to do um, plot by plot uh, as damage assessment, then drone based uh, cameras mounted can be very effectively used. This is some of the examples where it uh, overlaying the cadastral maps. Uh, we could find out for each of the farmer uh, their affected uh, areas. 
In similar way, we can also give advisories to farmers. So, uh, for uh, their requirements. Then likewise. Here, this is one example wherein on a every yearly basis for entire India here. Just I have shown you an example for Tamil Nadu. Uh, the crop area information uh, exactly agriculture area information. I should say no, it is not crop specific, but Kharif crop. How much area it is there? Rabi crop then uh, likewise a double cropping where it is followed. So all those things are uh, uh, um, mapped in our center at National Remote Sensing Center and all these you know are available as a WMS layer for you to work. Uh, you can directly access it uh, via QGS. Uh, uh, there in uh, there one option is their plugins via w, uh, WMS uh, service. You can access this as a background and uh, do further analysis. So remote sensing and GS again has tremendous potential. Uh, here what I have shown you is uh, once we have crop map, it opens up a lot of avenues for us to do analysis. So one of the examples that I have shown you here is uh, then. I can know based uh, overlaying this crop information on the uh, soil you know, on the soil information. I can know the areas that are highly suitable for uh, cultivating each crop. So wherein we can uh, through uh, uh, our extension system and then sensitize the farmers as to which particular crop if they grow in these regions uh, they it will be more uh, economical beneficial to them similarly uh, there are kharif rice fallows which if can be utilized uh, for growing other crops it can uh, uh, reduce some of the prices like for example if I can use it to grow for some pulses uh, so area under pulses can increase. So similarly here also in Tamil Nadu if I have certain if I can work uh, if or not I if we can work on in identifying uh, regions uh, wherein we can cultivate oil seed crops also. So that will give a, a, a very good income to farmers at the same time it will have a, positive effect in uh, reducing the prices that are soaring up uh, these days. So such uh, kind of analysis uh, can be carried out uh, on a every year to year basis so that such if such information is automated and timely it goes uh, uh, to the uh, agriculture department. So it they will be in a better position to uh, mobilize the things that are required to take up uh, these crops. And uh, other than this, we also have uh, remote sensing uh, potential in water resources and even as you know, it is heart of agriculture. So estimating it accurately, timely uh, is very essential here. Remote sensing can help us in uh, estimating the actual evapotranspiration at a larger scale. So I can estimate now uh, remote sensing if I am using Landsat kind of data sets, which is at 30 meter resolution on 30 meter resolution scale, the actual evapotranspiration. Uh, if for entire India, what we are doing under National Hydrology Project at 750 meter resolution, uh, we are estimating the evapotranspiration that also you can download it and use it for your applications. It is available from 2019 onwards. It's simple registration process is required and uh, you, can, you can Google uh, NRSC NHP. Uh, you'll get the web page and from there you can uh, uh, access these data products. So to validate these uh, or to calibrate these uh, data sets, you know, uh, we have set up a decovariance flux towers. Uh, in my group, my, we ourselves have set up around uh, 10 uh, ad covariance flux towers and likewise uh, in our entire NRS setup, we have almost around 20, uh, 22, I think, uh, ad covariance flux towers spread across the agro ecosystems of uh, India. And uh, with these data sets, you know, you can get almost all uh, the data, micrometeorological data that are required. So that uh, we are utilizing it for uh, calibrating our models at the same time for these different agro ecosystems. You know, what is the carbon sequestration potential? Then how these systems are acting as carbon source or sinks to uh, uh, the system, uh, whether these crops are uh, sourced to uh, carbon source or carbon sinks. So how uh, whether carbon neutrality or carbon budgeting can uh, happen, all these things we are working from uh, uh, 
I think for few towers from more than 10 years and uh, from other towers which have been recently established from almost two years. This information also, especially on weather data sets, uh, they are displayed onto a web page that also can be accessed uh, from yourself. And uh, for Tindivanam site uh, where our ORS is there, so there we have set up uh, one uh, uh, flux tower and uh, uh, here uh, for oil seed, research, uh, oil seed crops, we are uh, working uh, on the uh, eddy covariance uh, related studies. And next uh, part comes uh, is horticulture. So as you know that uh, uh, there are several schemes in horticulture and horticulture produce is also contributing tremendously to our uh, uh, GDP then how best to identify these crops? So once you know these where these crops are there, what is their spatial extent, then further uh, refinements can be all can also be done to know their uh, which of the farms are more productive in nature, this like age groups and which are the newly grown or newly sown crops. So based on which several uh, management practices and uh, policy decisions can be taken up and uh, uh, we have developed methodologies of identifying uh, major uh, uh, horticulture crops and uh, now the next stage what what can be done is we are now adopting uh, then uh, deep learning based uh, uh, techniques in automating identifying these crops across india so that is uh, what we are working and uh, several other students can also think about it and uh, contribute but here uh, one major component that is not done is production estimation uh, in horticulture crops. So there's also a good thought can be made. So like for example, I can tell you, say suppose this is a tree. So I have uh, fruits that are dis uh, there which can be visually seen. So if I can take photographs of these trees with some constant distance and uh, develop an algorithm in identifying the number of fruits, and then relate that fruit to the average fruit uh, size and fruit weight. Uh, so then I can know, uh, once I, I know the plant population of that particular region, and if I take statistically significant number of photos and automate them, I can arrive at the production. So such kind of, it's just an example, and many new things can be thought about. So such things students can think and uh, work on it. So these are some of the, you know, in remote sensing, we call spectral signatures. Each crop, you know, has diff unique uh, uh, ref reflectance pattern, both temporally as well as on a single date. So how it is manifested on crop at different months has been shown here. I'm sorry, some of the crops have not been displayed properly here. Huh. This is just an example here I was uh, showing under uh, Chaman project. Uh, which is called Coordinated Program on Horticulture Assessment and Management using Geoinformatics uh, under uh, Ministry of Agriculture. So for mango, banana, citrus, the major uh, districts uh, that are covered uh, are mapped by us and uh, now it is available. You can see them and call them as a WMS layer uh, from Bhuvan website of our NRSE bowen.nrse.gov.in from there you can visualize them and at the same time if you want prints you can take prints as pdf uh, and uh, if you want uh, to call it as a wms layer you can call it call that as a wms layer and further work on uh, uh, as further analysis by yourself in uh, gis atmosphere then this is an example with uh, just to tell you how uh, we can use uh, this uh, dl or ai based methods in identifying pest or disease. As I was earlier telling you, in if, if I have some, say, suppose grape, grape crop, downy mildew is there. So at that disease, you know, it's at different stages. So if I can take photographs of, uh, but here one uh, uh, point to be considered is I need to have hundreds and thousands of photographs for uh, DL based uh, uh, methods. But once and in one go, we cannot do that. But a couple of years, if we can uh, cover various farms and uh, collect these photos for a disease with uh, various stages and uh, tag all those things, all those photos, then there lies a tremendous potential in automating this. Say, suppose if I develop a, a module uh, wherein a farmer goes to his field, uh, takes a picture, and uh, the uh, software interacts with the server and uh, tells him, what is that particular disease and it is at what stage. So if I 
if he knows this information timely and the same uh, module can further tell him which particular insecticide or uh, pesticide he has to apply uh, at what level. So by doing so, he can uh, timely uh, uh, do the control measures. So that would be a big boost both for uh, academics, the department officials as well as uh, farmers. So which will um, uh, help in uh, improving the, uh, I mean, saving his crop. So this is uh, one of the examples of some of the photos I uh, took it from uh, Palnivelan sir uh, on Gaja cyclone because I just wanted to show you on Tamil Nadu region only. So you can you know the devastating effect that it had and uh, impact on the crops. So when the drone was flown, so this when we want to do for a smaller scale and uh, if we have large number of drones no issues but uh, drones uh, if we, if i want to if i have limited number of drones and uh, want to do plot by plot and at very high resolution scale count the number of trees count the number of uh, uh, i mean houses or any any structure that is damaged uh, by these cyclones drone is uh, drones are one very effective tool at the same time these drones you know cannot be taken in areas where we have high winds their aerial, uh, 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 I mean, aircrafts uh, would help, but in relatively uh, stable winds in the, uh, such regions, I, we can take them and uh, have very good quality information product coming out. And uh, this nowadays, the softwares to process the drone images are very good, and uh, we get uh, timely outputs of uh, these uh, images and can be analyzed and quick uh, damage assessment and relief measures can be taken up. You can see before uh, uh, the disaster and after disaster. So likewise, for a larger region, uh, the best alternative is satellite data. So here, uh, this is part of uh, a nearby Mysore district of Karnataka. So where we had a very high amount of rainfall. Almost uh, last year, it, we received almost double the annual uh, uh, rainfall uh, that was there. And uh, during the peak uh, vegetative growth of uh, rice crop, very large area was inundated with uh, floods and uh, large scale damage happened. And it, that inundation also was for very la uh, large amount of time. So these two words you please remember, the duration of uh, inundation and uh, uh, differentiating between inundation and flash floods. So why I'm telling you is you also have a research uh, question here that you can address. One is for which particular crop uh, the duration of uh, this inundation uh, would impact on yield. So for if it is rice, how much days uh, inundation should be there and uh, at what stage of rice crop it is there, what amount of uh, loss can happen. So such uh, there none of the simulation models, you know, have uh, this kind of information inbuilt. So if such kind of methods can quantitatively can be developed, so that would help uh, in a long way in uh, accurately assess, uh, assessing the damage that has happened. So likewise, uh, we, are, we know that if for th more than three days, if water is standing in a red gram, so it starts a, uh, a crop to start uh, assess, I mean, uh, impact would, uh, will be seen there. Uh, so uh, to what extent? So that quantification has not happened. Mostly it is qualitative in nature. So such places for different crops, if these methodologies can be developed, so that would be very helpful for uh, in quantifying the damage assessment. So likewise, early season drought, mid season drought, late season drought for different crops, uh, if, if it comes. So to what extent? A quantifiable extent uh, if a protocol is developed for different crops that again would uh, would benefit uh, uh, in a damage assessment so that was the reason for me to put these slides so once i have more than one band it can, i can see it in colors and you can see the blue uh, areas. These are all the flooded areas wherein uh, earlier it was one of the very good uh, uh, paddy uh, growing regions and which got uh, affected uh, this year. So this is uh, uh, another example just I wanted to show you earlier. I told you about the apps that are there and you see once uh, for you can see the entire India ground truth information that uh, once we overlay for a crop you know how for entire India it shows. So this kind of repository also is there. One is it acts as a repository, uh, then accurate information stays there. And at the same time, students or researchers can take these data sets and do uh, their further analysis if required, writing to MNCFC. And, 
this is another example you know unlike crops for soil uh, nutrient assessment you know or mapping soils uh, is a different subject we should know the mobility of nutrients if i want to uh, uh, know the interval between uh, one point to another point what is the distance between one point to another point uh, for uh, soil mapping uh, or nutrient mapping so such uh, literatures are there uh, wherein we can study them and uh, do the nutrient uh, based nutrient mapping uh, or fertility mapping and at uh, the same time uh, we can uh, directly see based on the tonal textural and associated uh, information that lies in the uh, bare soil regions uh, uh, time acquired data set i can use that in improving the uh, soil map and uh, uh, and improve uh, nowadays uh, for entire india uh, then uh, soil mapping uh, compilation is happening at 1 to 50000 scale further for uh, precision agriculture still better scale information is required so wherein uh, here uh, this uh, geospatial information would uh, uh, be a very good tool uh, which can assist in uh, improved uh, mapping activities so these are some of the uh, further if some three four slides you know here i just wanted to show you how these are being used uh, in uh, various level of planning so at, at the same time we also are uh, educating uh, the uh, educational institutes and uh, others to contribute in uh, uh, doing geotagging information so for example like 38 academic institutes in nine states and then have uh, helped us in co covering more than 8000 panchayats and uh, helped us in uh, doing geotag uh, information so that has shown here in uh, and uh, likewise synergistic use of geospatial and location based uh, services in governance uh, is uh, described here due to lack of time i'll just uh, uh, run through this uh similarly uh, you you have seen the below url bhuvan app you know bhuvan app one.nrsc.gov.in jsa jal shakti portal so if you go here you can also see uh, so various uh, information so several uh, uh, schemes have come and uh, wherein watershed development activities have happened and watershed related structures that have been developed then micro watershed uh, de boundary delineation all those things so all those informations are present here in this website uh, say for example you can see here uh, you have the recharge structures uh, then so water conservations that have have uh, structures related uh, that have happened so this is some part of tamil nadu i have shown here uh, district is Dharma, dharmapuri district so once you zoom and see this you can have information on uh, uh, many existing structures and uh, the advantage you know what happens is uh, if this is to a state department it is it is open access map so if if you want to and uh, if in case if you are unable to access you kindly write to us uh, we will send you the information uh, then uh, here what happens is if uh, a policy maker wants to again go for some water harvesting structures so if this kind of information is there if it is, if he is going for the similar place na so he'll be redoing it so he, such kind of uh, uh, things uh, duplicacy can be avoided by having such information already present and then jumping to altogether new topic uh, so we uh, in remote sensing you know there are certain other several satellites nowadays coming up so one of the uh, satellite called somi uh, uh is there uh, sorry sentinel 5p uh, sentinel 5p uh, has the uh, information on air pollution monitoring so like for example you have uh, uh, these are gen basically uh, at a larger coarser scale but still they are very sensitive and effective and uh, you can use them for your studies say for example you have information on methane uh, you have information on carbon monoxide nitrogen dioxide so such things uh, on a larger scale you can study its influences so we have noticed uh, for example uh, myself uh, in badipur region when forest fire uh, was there so there was drastic increase um, uh, in uh, some of these uh, 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 gases and that could be easily seen uh, so such and these data sets are uh, available on a daily time step interval so and you can monitor them so we had conducted such studies pre covid and post covid uh times and during covid times what are all the changes significant uh, uh changes were observed and uh, likewise we also 
have other data sets. These are some of the examples here. So like nitrous oxide concentration shown here between uh, one month uh, period mean uh, for various or wherever industrialization is happening or uh, industries or urban areas are there. Their emissions are uh, very clearly seen and how they spread and all uh, where persons from respective divisions who uh, on uh, atmosphere uh, sciences now so they can uh, study on this. And then uh, before I if I have sir, uh, some uh, five to ten minutes time, uh, so I'll just brief them on a uh, very, uh, very brief on hyperspectral. Uh, so what are all the avenues that are there wherein they can uh, uh, work? And see all this time. We were uh, talking about uh, optical data sets and uh, microwave data sets and uh, for evapotranspiration thermal data sets also come. So there is almost all one more domain of a data set available called hyperspectral data sets. So unlike the optical data sets, which are broadband, which have broadband and very few number of bands at the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Here we have contiguous bands in the entire uh, electromagnetic spectrum of 400 to 2500 nanometers and at short uh, wavelength interval. So this helps us in uh, uh, getting the diagnostic curves or uh, diagnostic identifying the diagnostic features of a particular uh, crop or particular uh, object of our interest. For example, here you can see uh, in the right hand side multispectral versus hyperspectral data that uh, uh, spectral reflectance curve that I have shown in the broadband. You know you have say suppose if I, if I'm using Landsat data, I may have around uh, six to seven bands. Then uh, you can see it is centered at uh, significant regions, but a broadband only one uh, value you'll get on reflectance. But in the same place, if I have more than 20, 30 bands, then for each of the variety or for each of the crop, I may get di diagnostic, uh, uh, I mean, reflectance uh, patterns uh, specific to that particular uh, feature of interest. So if, well, if there is a reduction in moisture, so that can be captured. If there is reduction in nitrogen content of leaf, so that I can identify. So how that uh, happens uh, in this uh, coming graphs, I'll show you. So with the, in this slide, what I just wanted to tell you is, so the spectral bands which are separate here, in the hyperspectral bands, there won't be any gaps. And we have, uh, uh, instead of wide bandwidth, we have a narrow bandwidth so that we'll have contiguous uh, narrow bands and which ultimately gives us complete representation of the spectral signature. So it see higher number of bands, higher number of data also comes with a disadvantage of larger image size. So wherein we need larger computational uh, things. And uh, one more uh, good news is nowadays some of the very good uh, quality free data sets are available here. So that also I'll tell principles I'll skip. This again uh, just uh, shows you the uh, uh, reflectance curve from a healthy vegetation. You know what is happening here? Because of uh, the pre presence of intercellular, uh, I mean canopy architecture and uh, the moisture content uh, in the uh, leaves or uh, plants. So you have a very high reflectance in the near infrared region and uh, so in the red region, what is happening? Uh, plants are absorbing uh, the radiation. So you find a dip here, uh, here in this uh, in this region, and uh, likewise, because of presence of chlorophyll. So uh, here, large large reflectance is there here. So we, uh, in this in this portion, between 0.55 to 6, and uh, likewise, just these are just an example, but. Uh, if I see between uh, reflectance curve between a wet soil and dry soil, you can see large uh, gap is there. So higher the dryness, higher is the reflectance there. But here in the vegetation, I'll come in the subsequent slides. You can see here the reflectance pattern uh, between a mulberry plant as well as soil altogether different. So you can appreciate uh, uh, the presence of uh, moisture, chlorophyll, all those things, how reflectance between soil and vegetation is different and uh, there are you know these are ground based uh, uh, say we have ground based sensors and uh, what generally happens is it comes with a instrument which is almost around 10 to 12 kg uh, almost around 10 kgs and you also have a 
optical fiber, uh, which you have to uh, carry and uh, show it to crops. So these are some of the uh, innovations that are made done by the scientists themselves so that they can, uh, it would become easier for them to travel across and uh, collect the information. Yes, so this graph you, tells you that uh, in the, we have chlorophyll absorption bands in blue and uh, red region. Then in the green region, chlorophyll reflectance is more. And uh, because of these, these are the characteristics because of the leaf uh, uh, pigments that are there. And however, the cell structure and the canopy architecture plays a role in the near infrared region. Here, you can see higher reflectance is there. And then uh, we have uh, some of the water absorption bands. And also uh, the leaf biochemical properties, you know, uh, influences the reflectance pattern uh, in uh, from almost around uh, one nanometer to 2.5, uh, 2500 nanometer. It's not one nanometer. So this is again uh, uh, reflectance properties for uh, grass, a typical uh, standard textbook uh, reflectance uh, curves I have shown you here, and uh, for a red soil. Then this particular uh, reflectance, why I have shown you here is unlike crops, soil or minerals, so they have, uh, you have seen earlier, so larger reflectance, but they have uh, dips, you know, that what we call absorption features at specified nanometer intervals because of the mineralogy of the particular uh, 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 either uh, uh, soil or uh, uh, minerals as such or rocks. So to identify them like unique, so these are called signatures, which are unique to these particular minerals. So these standard libraries are there. And when we go and have uh, the spectra measured of these rocks or minerals or soils, and uh, when we plot against them, and if they match, you know, so it is very easy for us to identify the mineralogy uh, of uh, the particular materials. So likewise, we have uh, uh, GSI, GSI and uh, some of our geoscientists uh, working uh, on identifying the mineral deposits um, as well as petroleum deposits. And it is a uh, very uh, efficient and a very effective method in identifying uh, these kind of uh, structures. So with all the uh, research done, few of the wavelengths they have identified wherein uh, we can observe some of the minerals like uh, 0.4 to 1.4 we have iron uh, uh, bearing minerals or carbonates and sulfates so likewise between 0.43 to 0.65 we have chlorophyll and b pigments that can be identifiable and between 2 and 2.4 we, we uh, can identify nitrogen and certain other protein structures so Furthermore, on this, if anything required, I can you can write to me. I can share all the literatures that are there, which uh, which you can work. And uh, alongside this, we also the the spectral resolution also is important. So certain uh, minerals or certain objects can be identified with a broad uh, broadband, uh, and a certain uh, where the bandwidth, even if it is broad, we can uh, easily identify them. Uh, but a certain other uh, between varietal uh, kind of uh, identification, we need narrow bandwidth. So those things are highlighted here, and uh, some of the applications I just uh, was typing then here in agriculture, like. Uh, we can go for crop stress detection very effectively, then uh, uh, go for uh, differentiation. So we have uh, identified uh, various varieties within a crop uh, using the ground-based hyperspectral measurements. So likewise, soil uh, mineralogy, soil nutrient content, and uh, more than soil nutrient, a uh, crop-based leaf nutrient content, especially for uh, spraying, taking of spraying of uh, uh, perennial crops you know? so this uh, horticulture crops this would be very effective method and uh, here i have shown you uh, the hyperspectral data that uh, uh, how for crops for various crop studies this can be taken so field based uh, crop discrimination can uh, happen then orchard crop identification then redder dynamics uh, especially it has a role to play uh, with changes in uh, uh, the nitrogen content and uh, there would be shift in the uh, uh, the reflectance uh, properties uh, in the in here in this particular uh, uh, region. So it will shift from NAR towards blue. So that we call blue shift. So so that uh, it plays a very effective role in identifying uh, 
the stress as well as uh, the uh, changes in nitrogen content. So again, uh, which can be related to crop condition, crop disease detection also can happen. So here we have some of the spectra that are shown for healthy and diseased uh, uh, crop. You can see here at uh, a specified uh, wavelength, you know, the difference. Because if we have entire spectra, one overlaid one above the other, you cannot uh, appreciate that. So, but once we statistically or mathematically evaluate this, you can see uh, this very small narrow uh, wavelength, but it has larger differences in the reflectance properties, which detects a particular disease. This, so likewise, we have identified crops. Uh, this uh, we have taken, I, I myself have done it uh, for around 19 crops in uh, University of Agriculture Sciences, GKVK Bangalore. Uh, so we have, could uh, identify this uh, spectra of different crops. And once we analyzed, we could identify unique bands that are unique uh, in identifying these particular crops. Like castor, groundnut, red gram, earlier I show some other crops. So the one uh, about uh, uh, healthy and stress that I was telling in the right the shift that is happening here, the blue shift that I was talking about is shown here. And this just I just wanted to show you so clearly earlier you saw in the previous slides easy spectras. So now when I have a satellite data, uh, so if I unknowingly just draw a spectra, so you can see in the downside so many spectras are there. So here the proper ground truth is required. I go to uh, uh, the particular plot, identify what uh, the all the dryads that are there, come overlay on the image, and then when I uh, draw spectra and analyze it accordingly, say example, I use stepwise discriminant analysis to identify certain bands, uh, then uh, uh, in a very effective way, I can identify those particular features, and then I can extrapolate it to the entire image. So that is just I wanted to convey by showing this clumsy <laughs> image here. And between dry and uh, uh, green leaf. Uh, so the changes in this uh, spectra that happens. Uh, so this is how uh, we can use uh, the information and uh, uh, some of our, my, this is one of from one of my colleagues. I have taken this slide so wherein they have used uh, to map various uh, 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 forestry uh, species that are there. So this is part of OT uh, and uh, using a uh, Earlier we had this data, now it is not there. Now Prisma, it is overtaken by Prisma data. Uh, so uh, this uh, is a uh, Hyperion data set. So likewise, we can use for surface uh, 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 from hyperspectral to the applications in uh, water resources. If we see then surface water mapping, then uh, water spread area, then the volume of area for, for water that is stored. Then if any sedimentation has happened, then how much of sedimentation has happened can be detected. So likewise, various uh, examples are there. And if I have a uh, very high resolution data set, so where in irrigation infrastructure is being developed, so I can I know to what extent the irrigation ex uh, infrastructure it is developed, whether uh, the development activities are complete or not. And uh, if it is a command area, how much of area is irrigated? You can see among the different dates. So there is in, uh, change from uh, greenness of an image towards blue. So which indicate which is indicating that uh, uh, irrigation uh, supply has extended in that entire command and the water is being irrigated. So likewise, if I have temporal data sets of uh, this is of one comma Hirakut, I think command area. So you can see from uh, top December uh, uh, December region up to March. So the progression of uh, the uh, crop sowing as well as its condition can be monitored. And uh, this I just wanted to show you we can differentiate between road and canal and how much of uh, uh, work that has happened in the subsequent slides here. You can see you have a canal network, but in between the there is a gap. So such kind of uh, uh, pending works that are there can be identified and uh, ask them to complete because if without this we cannot irrigate to the entire region or if any damage kind of thing has happened, we can identify them and ask them to uh, go for repairs and such things. And friends, uh, hundreds of hours of lectures, uh, video lecture data is available uh, from one of our uh, uh, centers called the Indian Institute of Remote Sensing uh, at uh, located at uh, Dehradun. And uh, they, I, you also can register uh, there and participate in online uh, lectures that are delivered. At the same time, uh, you also have the YouTube lectures. There are hundreds of hours in, 
uh, in available. So for any topic starting from basics of remote sensing till the advanced applications are how you can do in various fields, both in agriculture and non agriculture fields, uh, you can make use of this at the same time for data access. There are two portals. One is uh, nrsc.gov.in within that who and BHUVAN and another a portal called Vedas VDAS Vedas dot SAC dot GOV dot in. So in these two websites, you will get a, a lot of free data sets as well as soft, uh, open source software that are available, which which you can download and utilize them for your uh, 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 both uh, research as well as uh, educational activities. Thank you. Thanks for your kind. Uh, very useful lecture, sir. Uh, so almost we are doing this uh, in our students trial also to some extent. But you elaborately given all those things, not only for uh, crop acreage and crop production and estimation of yield, and also the drought monitoring, how we are doing. Many fundamental as well as advanced things you have projected here. So my yes. doubt is, uh, imagine for groundnet. Groundnet is, uh, you say that the image show can show that healthy plant or stressed plant you can monitor, isn't it? So at the time of harvesting maturity, uh, the groundnut wears unhealthy appearance. How can we distinguish between a healthy plant and also the normal plant? Right. So here, temporal data, sir. See, at the uh, towards the end senescence of the when we have a temporal data, so you can know the profile of a crop. So. After its peak vegetative grades, it uh, goes towards senescence, and that indicates senescence. And uh, uh, for stress, you, we can also add another important factor. Groundnut is a hardy crop, but at the same time, the rainfall information, if any, is there uh, at that time. If it is in the vegetative phase of flowering, or um, uh, uh, I mean, at the peak uh, growth stage, uh, but uh, post uh, uh, reproductive phase, when it is in senescence, obviously uh, it intermixes with uh, that of stress. But uh, temp because of the temporal data monitoring, you can differentiate between a senescence phase as well as the stress crop. And uh, in groundnut, especially uh, when we talk the identification of groundnut, sir, here it can be done in areas where you have a complete uh, canopy cover. So in certain areas like Karnataka and Andhra, where uh, up to September, if the crop is grown in June, up to September, uh, almost. Uh, uh, even up to September, only 80% of the soil background is covered. Rest is exposed. Under such conditions, it becomes very difficult in identification. Yeah. But in areas where it is irrigated or if in, in complete canopy closure is there, it is um, uh, detectable. Both in uh, we have seen both in uh, Gujarat region as well as Tamil Nadu region where it is uh, grown, where healthy crop, uh, I mean canopy cover is there, it is identifiable with a good degree of accuracy. Excellent, sir. Yeah. We are also facing that white spacer crop. It's very difficult. It seems not only here ground net. Uh, for uh, I have seen one of the crop in uh, cotton. The land coverage during the initial stage will be very less crop yes, coverage. Yes. That shows that based on the reflectance data, it shows that the acreage coverage will be less. It seems. Yes, sir, here we also have uh, advantage of microwave data. Microwave data has double bounce effect. So. There uh, we can you, uh, utilize microwave data and nowadays there is also one more research that is going on in uh, using both optical and microwave data together. So wherein the uh, uh, optical data, uh, good quality information can be taken up at the same time, the backscatter uh, characteristics of from the microwave data set can be taken up, fuse them together and improve upon the classification accuracy. So it's, such kind of approaches would help uh, in detecting the uh, uh, crop because uh, C-band data, any uh, feature above five centimeter uh, dimension can be detectable and uh, their microwave data would be useful. But uh, same C-band data with uh, high biomass saturates and uh, their optical data comes uh, into play and uh, uh, with uh, uh, indices that are sensitive to high biomass can be used and uh, uh, we can detect those uh, such crops. Okay, so the another thing, Yellowing of leaves in maize crop may be due to several reasons. Yellowing. Right. One is due to nutritional disorder. Right. Another one is due to pest incidents. Right. Can we distinguish in uh, the uh, whether it is due to 
nutritional disorder or the effect of pest or disease sir at farm scale research level scale it's doable but uh, field scale uh, with the coarser uh, hyperspectral data sets available we can, it's not possible yes. uh, so unless otherwise uh, some better techniques are identified say for example at a farm scale we identify this particular band and band combinations are consistent in identifying because initial stages you know it is just the reduction in so uh, leaf moisture later the chlorophyll uh, related issues comes so in the initial stages it is very difficult and later if it is due to uh, if it is not due to stress if it is due to disease it would be in concentrated patches and if we have very high resolution data only we can make out okay. but if it is with coarse resolution data it's difficult sir okay so these are the three questions i used to have in my mind for a long time to discuss with the expert i think i'm getting clear thank you thank you sir. so i will give chance to other people to discuss then again i'll come to you i got some uh, some more questions to clarify thanks by using uh, back uh, scattering value or spectral data one who can easily uh, identify which crop is uh, dominating in a particular uh, season whether it may be curry or rabi my question is that uh, uh, among the uh, particular uh, crop which variety or hybrid is dominating in a particular season so that we can sensitize the farmers uh, by giving forewarning particularly during epidemic period sir with both optical as well as microwave varietal level identification is not possible uh, then uh, varietal varietal level identification provided if they are grown in dominant regions with different uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, say suppose if I, if i talk about rice basmati and non basmati basmati is long duration crop and uh, other crop is a shorter duration crop if and they are grown in a larger uh, regions uh, so if such things if such kind of characteristics are there it can be detected with a uh, uh, optical cloud free high resolution satellite data but uh, if uh, if it is grown in very small patches then uh, their uh, accuracy in detection is again uh, a difficult sir so these are here we have some challenges so we have to address them and backscatter sir backscatter you know it's a property of a, um, a dielectric property as well as surface roughness so if a farmer grows a crop a little early so then uh, the surface roughness decreases and the backscatter starts increasing and uh, such kind of information ground truth information i should have so it is early sown late sown so then uh, if i overlay them onto the satellite image i can uh, able i can detect between uh, within the same crop early and late sown kind of uh, uh, things or else again if i don't have such information then i have to generalize thank you sir technology uh, sir another thing for the benefit of the students those who are working in uh, uh, weed uh, research the weed mapping we want to do is uh, for uh, region by so uh, one thing in the cultivated land and also the garden land with uh, uncultivated land and also the water bodies right so in our uh, weed project we need to know approximately we have got 43000 uh, tanks in tamil nadu so in 43000 is occupied by different kinds of uh, yes. weed mostly of your uh, right, uh, floating weed so in the floating weed there are different types in different regions so we like to map uh, the water bodies some of the water bodies are very clear some of the water bodies are uh, fully occupied by this uh, infested by water hydrant right, right. so we want to know what is the percentage of occupation of the occupied by the weed species and also the species size is there any work from your uh, nursery sir uh, here two things i'll tell at uh, research plot wise what you can do is you can have take a spectral radiometer or if you have a spectral imager uh, ground based you can uh, uh, develop the spectral signatures for the entire uh, uh, phenology ph phenophases of the those weeds and uh, that can act as a spectral library for the existing weeds uh, in agriculture regions or uh, any invasive species that have uh, weed species that have come up either in agriculture regions or forest or Uh, water bodies so that is one component another component is when once you have these signatures uh, 
that are uh, properly uh, built and uh, you can use this as a reference and uh, use our prisma data that is available for free uh, for those regions and if it is not there also you can uh, just register for it is just a small process of registration uh, register and ask them for acquisition uh, for that particular area they shall acquire and uh, uh, mail it to you and that data sets can be used uh, in softwares like nv or uh, our own uh, isro has uh, one qgs plugin called avyas a v y h a s so that can be added to QGIS and uh, you can do the uh, uh, hyperspectral analysis for Prisma data and uh, uh, identify the weed species. At present, is there any anybody working on that weed mapping in water bodies in your uh, institute? Weed My mapping as a director day before yesterday. At right, sir. A two T here. Come, yeah. Both your deputy director, and also the director. Right, right. Uh, Prakash has come. Yeah. Right, sir. So. Uh, weed mapping as such, uh, you know, at the uh, three years back, I myself had worked on a research plot. One Dr. Sanjay MT is there uh, in uh, uh, Bangalore campus, university campus. They have those uh, uh, plots for, uh, uh, I mean, uh, they have cultivated weeds and they keep those uh, research plots now for their studies. There we had uh, uh, taken some spectra. Uh, then uh, at the same time, a few of my colleagues are now working on uh, the water quality. As such, weed uh, they are not studying. On water quality in some of the major lakes, uh, uh, they are working. Uh, maybe uh, we can discuss with them. Okay. But as such, it is simple, sir. Uh, one, we, have, we should have uh, the uh, spectra for uh, that particular crop identified either on your research farm or even at the lake itself. And then uh, utilize it in a machine learning algorithm of these uh, open source softwares that are there uh, and uh, evaluate. Here in our uh, own RSGS division, uh, they have uh, softwares like NV or uh, IADAS or ArcGIS, uh, wherein uh, you can incorporate this Prisma data and uh, do the analysis, wherein you can identify this uh, weed, weed as well as weed species in the uh, lakes. I request some of the scientists and also the uh, research scholar can take this project. This will be useful work. Then another thing, uh, when you take the water bodies of Tamil Nadu, nearly 43,000 uh, tanks are there. Uh, we want to monitor during summer as well as uh, Kharif and Rabi. We want to uh, know the spread of water bodies, water coverage, and also not only the spread, and also the quantity of water stored in at least major tanks. Then after that, okay. as I said, coverage, quantity of water, and also the siltation. So anybody does this work, that will be great. So work. water spread area information that is available in our website itself. Spread area, so spread area can be taken. Then next comes the uh, volume. Volume. So volume also depends on the uh, uh, the dimensions you should know. So wherein uh, one recently they are working, uh, uh, two persons are working in our NRSC. One, yes. uh, they are utilizing the sounders. Uh, to know the yeah. uh, uh, depth of depth. the uh, depth information and uh, similar such kind of studies can take up or operationally can be used. Uh, at the same time, when there is no water, you know, they are calculating the uh, DM and then utilizing it in a, a alternate way to know the volume of water that is stored. So these are some of the approaches. But to make a quick assessment, sir, on, a, on such a large amount of water bodies, what I suggest to you is, you, we uh, can purchase some of these uh, uh, sounders you know, that are uh, automated sounders uh, so that traverse across uh, the water body and collects uh, for every uh, defined interval collects the uh, depth information and that can be taken and uh, to the area of water spread that is there volume can be calculated on a uh, near real time basis which more effectively because we cannot wait for that water to dry up and then do other activities now. So such to save time and to regularly monitor this, this kind of activities can be done. And uh, for ex uh, for silt uh, related, so because silt already siltation that has happened, you will know by the volume that is there and the initial volume when the tank was built. Uh, so uh, by that you can calculate the silt that, that is deposited and for the uh, during runoff now what is happening the uh, if uh, siltation is happening then through some of the uh, water balance models you know one i suggest is at a 
if if you write it to sorry if you write it to uh, water resources division in nrsc uh, one uh, online tool has come up called humid under national hydrology project so they will uh, allow give you access uh, for at uh, humid humid uh, so they will uh, enable access uh, for you uh, to work at uh, uh, micro watershed level so you need not have any software it is just an online web browser uh, tool some of the inputs you have to incorporate at the background swat model runs and gives uh, gives you all the necessary outputs so that i think would could be one effective method wherein uh, certain of the requirements can be filled sir i want to react to this line what is the operation rate from one hectare of uh, paddy field anybody in the class what is the amount of water we are losing every day today from one hectare of paddy field the last two days two days plus imagine uh, two days maybe two days city fine fine you may take fine fine what is the amount of uh, water we are losing today from one next day five mm today is uh, eight you be five mm what is the last day peace they are recording anybody working on water so on an average we are losing 50000 liters from one hectare 50000 liters of water, water. we are losing huh. in the form of evapotranspiration okay from one hectare of land right so can we estimate uh, the water evapotranspiration from the paddy field during the initial stage and the phenophase wise so the data that we are providing all this, all this water be uh, uh, evaporated through plants as well as from the oil yes. from the field this is happening because we never calculate if you calculate it this happens uh, if you give me just a small time i'll show you here because uh, this is the time to wake up what's the water we are using for producing one hectare of paddy so not less than one crore 20 lakh liters some cases one crore 50 lakh liters this, this is the number we are using 1500 mm so 1 cm is equal to 1 lakh liter 1 cm is equal to 1 lakh liter whether it is be added in the form of irrigation or it is evaporated in the form of evapotranspiration or last through evapotranspiration so we need to estimate so because we are all copying the old data only it's all imaginary data i wish my students to go through this why what is happening really in the field because if not agronomists then who else can do it and it's uh, agronomists uh, can very effectively do it in a very nice manner so evapotranspiration here we are addressing sir okay. so right now on the website we have put it at 5 km grid so which we will be very soon updating with the 750 meter grid so this is one of uh, where i am directly involved here uh, in this project uh, we have uh, given the entire description just a minute ha huh. so say for example uh, this is the map uh, for 20th february 2023 for entire india so if i click for any particular region here you take kerala or tamil nadu in any region sir here's any one point within that uh, particular yeah, state yeah, where the rice area is more okay say for example i'll zoom this uh, area yeah, say for example i clicked on this particular point i have reached what is the ah 3.8 mm so since this is a uh, little coarser in nature the values would uh, you uh, you might get a little uh, less but still this is very uh, good at this uh, and uh, uh, this has been validated and you are getting the evapotranspiration on for every day say for example i go here 
this evapo transpiration of 3.876 mm per day exactly. uh, is what is happening so this for so, over area and this for one hectare is 5 5 5 mm right it's good near uh, our value near so likewise value. for entire region uh, it is calculating for entire uh, uh, nation and uh, this data upon registration can be easily downloaded freely downloaded and then you can overlay the boundaries of your uh, uh, either watershed or uh, district or uh, basin or sub basin and uh, know how much amount of evapotranspiration right. is happening in the entire uh, cropping uh, se- season and uh, so this is the uh, this open, is the actual open, evapotranspiration open, this is open, this open. openly available sir. fantastic fantastic please uh, please make a note of the website and see to that then uh, another important uh, uh, things to be clarified is if you take any point then the data good good for what is the radius of it sir uh, here for display right now it is at 5 km grid ah. so now the data that would be updated or once you are downloading it would be at 750 m grid so 750 m by 750 m once you convert into hectares so many hectare area it so would be for that particular hectare. so many hectares ah. so just multiply that amount of hectares with uh, this amount of water being uh, uh, water right, being lost right. so likewise we are also working on the water productivity yes. so for with different irrigation practices that is happening so how much is the water productivity for crops in a pilot scale for 10 different agro ecosystems we have uh, taken up now so that once uh, that we establish them and then we would like to uh, uh, extrapolate it for the larger region so that is uh, what we are doing right now sir fantastic sir fantastic then another uh, question is uh, will it hold good for the whole day or the particular time the value will be keep on changing morning will be yes, yes, you so this uh, is speaker. finally the final output that is provided to use for yesterday. one day for yesterday mm. daily information okay. so it is not for today we are keeping lag of 2 to 3 days see the latest date 20th, it is 20th. on 20th february 20th, so 3 day lag is there because data has to come we have to process do the quality check and then uh, once it is uh, quality check is done and it goes on to the right. web web page so that 2 to 3 days lag pay, period is there so similarly you do for carbon flex also on carbon flexes we are uh, we are doing i'll just show you uh, one fl- uh, here only uh, flex dashboard right now what i am associate that uh, associated that only i am showing you here so these are some of the 10 sites uh, where uh, we have for different agro ecosystems uh, are, uh, we have set up uh, the flex towers yeah. wherein we are monitoring uh, the ca- both uh, evaporative fluxes as well as carbon fluxes and uh, we are trying to uh, study the uh, uh carbon related as well as uh, evaporative fluxes uh, that are happening and their interactions all those things so with tnau we have set up in at tindivanam and uh, see here ors tindivanam the based on the internet speed it uh, uh, takes time you can know the rainfall wind speed uh, all those things this is updated every 5 minute interval and uh, the one that is shown here in the green uh, uh, box table now so that is for previous day previous days record on a daily time step and uh, the one that is displayed here on to the tower uh, so that is for uh, that is updated every 5 minute interval so this is for visualization that we have kept it for public uh, visualization and uh, also this is also open source okay thank you you can see the yeah. date and time sir right sir. thank you thanks for uh, clarifying my doubt uh, please any queries so if there are no queries we thank uh, dr mohammed ahmed sir scientist from M- nrse bangalore for his excellent eye opener lecture and uh, he has enlightened about uh, the applications of remote sensing in agriculture many of us will be new to the subject so we know what are the avenues open in remote sensing with respect to agriculture we can also think about some of the projects for your upcoming uh, career so thank you so much sir thank you for uh, giving this wonderful lecture thank you thank you Thank you so much.